Hello everybody, my name is Kit, and today I'm talking about some history that I've been researching for a class that I've been in this past semester. So I've been taking uh, a class that is focused on queer history, and I've been researching this one particular element of American history that honestly gets talked about a lot in you know school and stuff like that but i didn't know until i took this class that this particular thing was incredibly queer <laughs> so when i was younger i was in a lot of Amer like obviously i grew up in the public school system and so i had a lot of american history classes when i was in middle school i actually had a teacher who was really cool because she was this woman who grew up in the segregated south and then left the south because she was her she and her family were african-american left the south and then came back after uh segregation was like d overturned and stuff like that and so she talked a lot about different aspects of african-american history and culture in her class and so we spent a lot of time talking about the harlem renaissance and she to be fair this probably wasn't part of the curriculum she never mentioned how queer the harlem renaissance were so i kind of want to go into a very specific aspect of what developed in the harlem renaissance specifically the ballroom scene the ballroom scene uh was in a lot of different places around the u.s and in europe but the specifically the harlem scene is what we saw develop into a lot of really important elements of queer american history so i wanted to talk about that because frankly i didn't know until i took this class that it was even queer at all <laughs> so yeah first of all the harlem renaissance uh for those of you don't who don't know uh, or don't remember because let's be honest school is easily forgotten because it's been a while uh, <laughs> the Harlem Renaissance was uh, one of the outcomes of the Great Migration which was the mass exodus of African Americans from the reconstructed South following the implementation of Jim Crow legislation that systematically suppressed African American voting rights and the not systematic aspects of oppression that were going on there were developments of terror groups like the KKK and the violence they would enact on African Americans down there led to a massive amount of African Americans moving out of the South and going to more urban areas uh, such as California, Chicago, and specifically the Harlem District in Manhattan, New York. And so with the Great Migration and the newfound concentration of African Americans in Harlem, uh, statistics pointing to there being a about 175,000 individual African Americans, which would make it the largest concentration at that time of Black people in the entire world in terms of like being in one city. With that concentration, there was the emergence of an African American middle class. There was the emergence of art, music, dance, all different types of like cultural and artistic expression and development going on during this time period. Artists like Langston Hughes come from this era. A lot of jazz musicians come from this era. Things like that. Part of the reason why this was able to develop is because in the north specifically in manhattan there were not as many of these laws like, that were being passed in the south like in the north there weren't jim crow laws there was some amount of segregation obviously because unfortunately there's no place in america ever that gets anything 100 percent right however the segregation and the oppression of african americans in New York was nowhere near as destructive or as oppressive as it was in the South. So that allowed for African Americans to have more economic movement and be able to pursue the arts. Given that there was this artistic movement, one of the things that emerged was the ballroom scene in Harlem. Now, the ballroom scene initially started out as these balls where people would come and they were generally costume balls and one of the aspects of a lot of the costumes is there would be a lot of people in drag not just you know 
drag queens there were obviously there were men that dressed as women but there were also women that dressed as men now this was actually illegal in the united states at the time but you know it's a ball it's fun it's a party so these things kind of developed and they continued to happen and it got to the point that these balls were really well known within the area as these fun things that people went to not everyone who went to these balls were queer. There were a lot of straight people who went to these balls because it was entertaining, but this was a place for a lot of gay men and people that had not necessarily cis gender identity uh, to be out and open and you know accepted there were there are documented instances of you know people going to these balls with their boyfriends or their partners and being able to dress in these ways that they weren't able to dress in day-to-day -day life and with the emergence of this there was also a lot of scrutiny there was a group uh, called the Committee of 14 that investigated these balls and released their findings, specifically referring to the events that were going on at these balls as perverted. An interesting thing is the report described um, a scene filled with quote-unquote phenomenal male perverts in expensive frocks and wigs looking like women, which honestly as an aside, that's just kind of funny to me that the phrase phenomenal appears in a report that is meant to be condemning these individuals because it's just kind of like this attitude of like, oh my god, this is so scandalous, but they also looked really good. <laughs> like, you know? So they there was a lot of pushback from the wider community, the wider residents in Harlem. However, that didn't stop these balls from happening. They continued to happen. They started to grow to the point that we see things that look very similar to if you're familiar with drag, look like drag competition. These are all the precursors to drag, by the way. So the ballroom scene had two very distinct aspects to it. Specifically, there were the events, you know, the balls, and there was also the community aspect. But first of all, the balls themselves were really interesting. They were held in locations such as the Hampton Lodge or the Rock Island Palace, where these performers, generally queens, would come and perform for a panel of judges where they were then scored and critiqued. And, you know, there was placing, there were prizes, things like that. Critiques on the performances had to do with costumes, uh, including the composition and quality of what the performance were wearing, with special note being given on whether these individuals were wearing, you know, luxury or designer brands, and whether or not those uh, labels were authentic. Uh, there was also, you know, notice put to people that, you know, designed their own clothes. Uh, the, another thing that was critiqued and scored in these performances were, you know, dance, uh, modeling, the concept of reading comes from the uh, uh, ballroom scene, and specifically reading is a term that, you know, is still used in drag communities that can be described as humorous insults meant to dig out other performers. Specifically with dancing, this is where the term voguing comes from. It predates individuals like Madonna, it, it predates, you know, RuPaul's Drag Race, all that. It comes from the Harlem Renaissance. It comes from, like, the specific aspect of the Harlem Renaissance. So they had all these different things that they would perform in, and judges would, you know, score and rank them. And there were different categories, too. So all of them are doing these things, but there are different categories, you know, for the type of costumes that these queens would show up in. Obviously, over the years, over the decades, there have been, you know, newer categories, but... So, these are some categories that, as far as I can tell, were some of the original categories. I got this list from the website The Black Youth Project. So, first, there were the Butch Queens, which were gay men who embodied like this kind of hyper masculine aesthetic so you know like exaggerated masculinity shown off in both the performances that were given and the fashion that were worn by these uh individuals there was the femme queen category which is a term that is widely recognized as a precursor to people that we would nowadays recognize as trans women or transvestites there's a lot of you know debate on you know the the evolution of gender identity specifically from this period in terms of like looking at it through a modern lens honestly you can't assign modern identities to 
historic individuals because their concepts of gender and identity and the society they lived in are so radically different from the society we live in now. But even as we get into like stuff that are, is more recent, you will see a lot of people who are identified either as closer to modern drag queens or trans women that fell into this that fall into this category or would participate in this category of femme queens, which embodied like hyper feminine costumes and performances. So you know, similar to what we see nowadays with drag, you know, the exaggerated makeup, the exaggerated features with like padding the like the very like revealing outfits and things like that that's what you would see specifically in the femme queen category and then there was also these two categories that applied to you know like that represent the previous ones but slightly differently which was the butch queen and femme queen realness which involved specifically embodying a realistic appearance of the gender they were dressed up as in the documentary paris is burning one of the queens within the documentary describes the the individuals that participated in femme queen realness as the basically the women that were passing the trans women that were passing they were able to leave these events without like they were able to leave these events still fully dressed up in what they wore to this competition and they would be able to go home virtually undetected not be subject to you know harassment or violence on their way home those were you know the femme queen realness like like that specific category that's what that embodied and then there was another category that applied to both which was the uh butch queen and femme queen realness with a twist which was you know same as the previous category the realistic appearance of the gender being portrayed and then switching into a more camp portrayal which is a blending of you know the two different categories of just butch queen and then butch queen realness or femme queen and then femme queen realness that kind of thing and then there was specifically the virgin versions of these categories which was specifically meant for performers that had been doing these balls and things like that for less than a year something specifically i do want to note about the femme queen categories is that not every person who you know did the femme queen drag performance was a trans woman there was a substantial amount of performers that did take hormone replacement therapy and undergo surgeries to live their day-to-day -day lives as women but not all of them would you know live that way outside of these performances there were plenty of cis gay men who were participating in this category as well it's just that there are a significant amount of trans women that did participate in this specific category an interesting thing about these categories is the commentary they do provide on the lived experiences of you know african americans and latinx individuals during these time periods because the ballroom scene does stretch out it's a current movement as well but there was a very prevalent community in the 80s and 90s of the ballroom scene which was documented in the documentary paris is burning where the documentary focuses on interviewing several of the prominent queens that are in the ballroom scene at the time and within the documentary they show some of these competitions and the ways that you know the queens are dressing and the way they are performing and there's some interesting commentary specifically from dorian corey which is a legendary old school drag queen that was featured in the documentary she is also the founder of the house of corey that talked about how the portrayals in ballroom specifically come from the fact that these communities did face a lot of prejudice from wider society she specifically said that in real life uh, you can't get a job as an executive unless you have the educational background and the opportunity now the fact that you are not an executive is merely because of the social standing of life black people have a hard time getting anywhere and those that do are usually straight in a ballroom you can be anything you want you're not really an executive but you're looking like an executive you're showing the straight world that i can be an executive if i had the opportunity because i can look like one and that is like a fulfillment the thing is after i watched that documentary like obviously i was watching that documentary and reading a lot of different things for research for this project and that quote stuck with me like i was thinking about it even after i had moved on from the documentary you know i had gotten a lot of the information i needed to go on to write 
an essay for this project, but that quote stuck with me, specifically this idea that you have to look elsewhere to be given these opportunities that you know, are not generally afforded to queer individuals specific or even people of color, much less being a queer person of color. A lot of the economic disparity between different racial groups in the United States specifically has to do with the biases of generally white people in power that are the ones in control over whether or not a person is able to get into a university to achieve higher education or even get hired in a corporate setting or be up for promotion in that corporate setting. And so I think it's really interesting and really sad that this art form was the only way some of these individuals were able to experience that specific concept, even if it's only a performance. And it is just really amazing to me that, you know, this this was a film that came out in the 90s, like eight years before I was born. And we still see that kind of sentiment today, but it is nowhere near as bad as it was then. And so that actually kind of shifts nicely into the second and I would argue more important aspect of the ballroom scene that emerged, which was specifically the social element. There obviously was the social dynamics of the ball itself, which, you know, rivalries between different competitors and the different houses. But, you know, there was social elements of it that existed outside of these competitions, you know, before the competitions happened and after the competitions wrapped up. There were still all of these individuals that lived in Harlem and were interacting and surviving. And one of the things that emerged specifically was the houses. And the houses, as described in a couple of articles, are kind of like teams, but the houses also, you know, served a more conventional understanding of the term. The heads of house were generally these legendary queens who had won several balls and went on to found these houses. And then the people that were under them were referred to as the children, which were younger competitors, younger queens looking to, you know, find their place. And generally these children were, sometimes they were actually children. They were kids that had been kicked out of their homes because they were queer. And so these are kids that, you know, are as young as like, you know, maybe 12, 13, 14, and they don't know how to pay rent. They don't know how to get a job. They don't know any of these things. And so these houses would take these kids in and alongside, you know, mentoring them in this performance style, mentoring them in, you know, how to vogue, how to style their costumes, how to modify their costumes, how to do all of those things. They were also mentoring them in how to be a person, how to, you know, go get a job, how to like find a place to live, how to provide for yourself, providing the, you know, living experience and, you know, education for living that a nuclear family generally should be providing for these kids. However, because their parents couldn't accept them, someone else had to, you know, pick them up and take care of them. And that was a very important aspect of these houses, that even though they weren't biologically related, they still acted as family. They supported each other. They were there for one another, both in terms of like a competition, like a team, but also like an actual family. And so the existence of these houses, you know, provided individual support and allowed individual queer people to live their lives. But it also had a wider effect because these houses and these communities that, you know, grew and developed around these balls also were also were places where, you know, activism and community change could be perpetuated. This is where we get a lot of the care that was given to people that contracted HIV and AIDS when hospitals weren't really doing anything about providing for these sick individuals, these communities that were either in the ballroom scene themselves or just various queer communities were the ones stepping up to provide for each other in times of crisis. And you would see protests and things like that that would come from the oppression that these people faced that they wouldn't be able to, you know, unite against if they weren't brought together by the ballroom scene. A question my professor insisted that I answer for this essay. 
that I had to write was why do I think that this topic goes unexplored when queer history is analyzed as a whole or studied as, or discussed as a whole. And that is something that I've been thinking about a lot in terms of various aspects of queer history, why it's not talked about in mainstream society, in mainstream classes. When I was in middle and high school, I never heard about queer people contributing to history, even though we've always been here. There are so many advances in society and technology that are attributed to queer people. And while their names aren't necessarily erased, their identities are. I learned about the Harlem Renaissance when I was 13 and 11 years later at the age of 24 is when I find out that the Harlem Renaissance, while mainly being a artistic movement for Black people, was also a artistic movement for queer Black people. And things like that, honestly, as a kid, it would have been really inspiring to hear that people like me were doing great things. I'm a creative, I'm a writer, and as a kid, it was always very disheartening to never really see anyone that was like me in literature that I had to read for class or in the history I was learning about. And so there are a lot of aspects of queer history that don't get talked about unless you specifically go looking for this information, unless you specifically decide, you know what, one of the classes I'm going to take this semester is about queer history because you feel as a gay or trans person that you don't know your own history, which is the position I was in. And specifically with the Harlem ballroom scene, there were a lot of things that I realized played a part in the suppression of this kind of information. And frankly, it's really disheartening to acknowledge that these are things that we still deal with today, that these are biases that we have to argue with ourselves about, that we have to argue with other people about. Specifically, I mentioned the Committee of 14 earlier, right? They were the ones that, you know, released this report on the balls that specifically referred to what was going on as a perversion, as a, it was a lack of morality. It was this disgusting thing that needed to stop. And... In a way, I can kind of understand that mentality because we see that kind of sentiment perpetuated in queer spaces today. This idea of like purity, of like virtue, virtue and purity and not doing anything viewed as gross or immoral or questionable. We see that sentiment today with younger queer people that mirrors an ideology that was developed as queer people were trying to figure out where we fit into American society, where we are able to be comfortable what we want to be in this society. There was this idea of assimilationism that came out that was basically the idea of gay people portraying themselves as being just like any other middle class American. And that involved, you know, not being this aggressively vibrant queer person that we see today that these kids are trying to be like, oh, I'm not like those gay people, those trans people that have these weird or like verbose or loud ideas and identities. That existed back then. That's what the Committee of 14 was. It, but specifically, instead of being queer people that were trying to distance themselves from other queer people. These were African Americans that were part of a diaspora that came from a place that came from several places where if they even performed the slightest perceived slight, whether they actually did it or not, against a white person, they would be subject to extreme violence like lynching and sexual violence. And so I can understand the fear 
that when you are subjected to living in an environment like that and then leaving to a place that is comparatively safer, not completely safe, but comparatively safer. You don't want to rock the boat, so to speak, with these new people that you are now surrounded by and still are systematically lower than. You want to appear as if you should be there, as if you are worthy of respect. And to be entirely honest, everyone's worthy of respect, whether they do drag or not, whether they're straight or queer or whatever. Everyone's worthy of respect, however, because a lot of these people were afraid of the violence they were escaping. They didn't want to do anything that would provoke more of that violence to be enacted on them. So it was this idea of distancing, of being like, no, we have to be these good moral people in order to stay safe. But oppressors don't care if you are one of the good ones. We see that today with the idea of being a good gay. It's a futile attempt at trying to make conservatives like us because we are better than the Tumblr gays or whatever. It's an idea that you see over and over again because history is a circle and it never works. It only The only way people are going to get respect, marginalized people are going to get respect, is if they push for and demand it, not by laying down and trying to be this approachable or desirable type of marginality. The easy to accept ones that, you know, don't criticize the microaggressions said to them, that don't lash out when any type of bigotry is presented to them, that are nice and better suited for the majority to not feel challenged. And so that is one of the aspects as to why this isn't nearly as talked about. A related idea is that this is a community that now and back then, in the over 100 years that the ballroom scene has existed, is almost entirely Black or Latinx. These are marginalized groups that we in America don't necessarily like paying attention to that much. We seem to think that aspects of history aren't as important if they don't involve cis white men. And that's not true. All history is important. And the activism and the lives of queer people of color are just as important as the white people that were also doing activism at the time. There is a lot of ignorance towards these individuals, and this is why the idea of trans massage noir, specifically transphobia and misogyny and racism all wrapped up into one, pointed specifically at black trans women. These are the reasons why individuals like Marsha P. Johnson and Sylvia Rivera people who were very important to the Stonewall riots largely went unacknowledged in later protests and later calls for activism following the Stonewall riots and only very recently started getting the proper acknowledgement for their contributions to queer activism. It's this sentiment that we seem to continually have despite trying to have the best principles, the best politics, to be the most open-minded. These stories continue to go untold and unacknowledged. And there is, you know, the bigotry that is both conscious and subconscious. We are all trying to unlearn the things that we are conditioned from a young age to believe, even if we don't realize we're being told to believe those things. Another aspect is this puritanical like modesty that for some reason America has and for some reason I mean this country was founded on Christianity like <laughs> who am I kidding we may not be a Christian nation state but a lot of the moral ideas and the way a lot of our legislation is made comes from Christian ideas and there's this Christian 
idea towards modesty and a repulsion towards sexuality sexuality not as in you know the attraction to men or women or anyone outside of that binary but specifically the embodiment of being a sexual being that kind of sexuality in this specific instance we seem to dislike anyone who has sexuality women both cis and trans women are constantly critiqued for either covering up and being prudish or dressing very revealing and evocatively and embracing their sexuality. We constantly critique the presence of sexuality everywhere. Like clockwork, every beginning of the year around March, April, we start discussing whether kink belongs at Pride. Like it's a tradition at this point. And finally, a lot of the people that are subjected to this scrutiny are sex workers. Even to sex workers have historically and currently faced a lot of issues with the fact that people don't respect the work they do. Companies constantly change policies to try to prevent sex workers from making money. And a lot of the individuals that were part of the ballroom scene, that were part of queer activism, were sex workers. And for some reason, we try to brush that aside. We don't want to acknowledge that these people that paved the way for us to have the rights and protections that we do and the ones we're still fighting for we don't want to acknowledge that they were sex workers and frankly it's these ideas of purity and implicit bias and bigotry and this idea of marketability of assimilation of being the right kind of person for the majority to like. It's these ideas that are the reason that the ballroom scene that developed in Harlem and Chicago and Los Angeles, it's reasons like that that we don't widely talk about. The ballroom scene, the reasons why we don't talk about a large portion of queer history. And frankly, I made this video because even though I'm nobody, someone has to talk about it. We all should talk about it. So I'm going to start that conversation.